Um, this session is being recorded. It is now officially being recorded. Um, so if you have any questions that you want to ask me um, that are private afterwards, uh, I would love to answer those questions. Um, oh, I should turn my... I'm here too, uh, but this is also a picture of me. Um, you might see my dog running around back there, getting mad about stuff. Uh, but again, I'm Lindsay, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm coming to CIDL with a background in composition and gender and sexuality studies. So as I'm talking today about building in accessibility into your courses, I'm going to be talking about it definitely from this mindset of thinking about courses that are more writing intensive or have the ability to be creative. Some of these things aren't going to work for your classes and that's totally fine, but we're going to have a chance where everybody can share uh, later on what what you're doing that you think is super effective because I'm sure you all have amazing things that you're already doing with your courses that are really, really helpful to students with disabilities. And here's my contact information. Uh, we'll send out the slides after and you'll have all my information uh, in case you wanna reach out to me. So the objectives for this workshop is that we're going to hopefully by the end of this be able to understand that accommodations change the delivery method of the content, not the standards. Um, it might change the assignments that are being turned what they turned in what they look like, but we're still going to focus on the same concepts and skills. We're going to be able to identify ways accommodations can be built into coursework and policies, identify ways that materials can become accessible, and identify accessibility tools and services that are available. Through Blackboard and Microsoft alone, there's like half a dozen. So I'll uh, point those out to you. We won't get a bunch of time to like go in depth about them. Um, but I'll show you what exists. And then, as I said, if you need to email me or if you want more information after, that's totally fine. I will also share links with this presentation um, after this presentation that will take you to tutorials on how to use them. Before we get into uh, talking in great depth about uh, accessibility and accommodations, I want to acknowledge that there's a language debate going on um, around how we talk about people with disabilities. So uh, there are, yes, you are going to get a copy of the presentation. Um, great, great question. Um, I'm sorry if I did not uh, say that earlier. Yeah, of course. Um, so whether we say students with disabilities or disabled students is uh, something that is questioned um, or people with disabilities or disabled people is, is something that's talked about a lot. Um, and this idea that uh, whether we can separate the person from the disability, whether or not we want to make that uh, a focus when we're talking about identities. Um, and so I want to say that saying disabled students is not an inappropriate way to refer to students. I'm probably going to switch back and forth. Uh, but when we are talking about people with disabilities, we're going to use the language that they use about themselves. Um, we want to make sure that we aren't uh, talking about disabilities as being a bad thing. Being disabled is not a bad thing disabled is not a bad word. Um, and there's also this uh, debate going on about labeling things as special needs versus needs. Um, and so I would just like to put out there that uh, if somebody needs something in order to function, in order to complete their work, it's a need. It's not a special need. Uh, everybody needs different things when it comes to completing their work for school. So 
uh, labeling something as a special need makes it seem like it's asking a lot. Uh, it's just a need. If somebody needs tutoring, if somebody needs a one on one conference, it's just a need, just like you just need something um, in Braille instead of uh, in printed out paper from the computer. I also want to talk or uh, point out that accessibility is mandatory. So uh, NIU Ethics and oh. Compliance Office. Oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. This is going to be a rough one. I'm so sorry. Uh, so the Ethics and Compliance Office says that all content has to be accessible. That is something that uh, can't be up for debate. So um, if you are building accessibility into your courses in ways that are just that are beyond accessible documents, um, it works for everybody. You put in the time up front and then uh, you are meeting the needs of everybody in, in the class. Uh, so if you have more questions about that accessibility, there is uh, a page for NIU Ethics and Compliance about it, uh, and I will be sending out the link for that as well. It's also important to note that students aren't required to disclose anything about their disabilities. Uh, I'm sure many of you have already gotten um, letters from the DRC explaining uh, that a student needs accommodations for your class. You will see that it does not go, it does not define what the disability is. It just says this person needs time and a half on assignments or um, needs to be able to use their computer in class. Um, so you might not know exactly what they need other than what's described on that sheet of paper, but they might need a variance of, of what's described because uh, they're working from what, uh, what the standards are for uh, the state, not for what is uh, needed for that particular person based off of the, you know, level of uh, how uh, hard of hearing they are, whatever. Um, it's also important to recognize that 27% of adults in the U.S. have some type of disability and that disabilities are long term, short term. They can develop gradually. Suddenly it can be something from birth. So uh, when we are thinking about disabilities uh, and we're thinking about accommodations, just to be aware that not everybody is going to have accommodations. Uh, right from the get-go when they're coming into your class. Maybe they haven't been diagnosed. Maybe things are shifting um, with their body. Maybe they have a sudden injury, which causes a uh, temporary disability. Um, and all of those are reasons why they might need accommodations and they might need something to become more accessible to them. As I mentioned earlier, the standards of the course and learning objectives don't change uh, based off of accommodations. The delivery method of the content, the way that the uh, course materials are shared or the format of them, and time spent working on assignments might change. So looking at additional time on assignments, early access to course materials, alternate uh, formats um, or free use of technology, those are all things that might uh, be included automatically with somebody's accommodations. And those are all things that you can build into your course from the get-go so that if somebody wants to use their computer instead of handwriting uh, notes for your class, then that's just fine. That's that's already expected. If it's easier for them to record a video instead of write a paper for whatever reason, that might be something that's built into the assignment. And accessibility comes in a lot of different ways for your class. It could be your classroom. It could be the technology used or by you or the students. It might be the assignments. It might be attendance policies or other policies, and it might be communication. 
So when we're thinking about the classroom, we want to think about uh, buildings, bathrooms, desks, tables, and outlets all being accessible for students. Some of these things are out of our control, and I totally recognize that. Um, but that's something to keep in mind. If you can get an accessible table in your classroom, if there, um, if a student needs technology and the outlets aren't accessible, you can reach out to uh, building services. You could even talk to uh, the DRC or your department, and they might have um, something to help you with that. They might have people that can help you get those things that uh, that you need in order to make sure that the student um, can be in your class, do the things that they need to do. Um, when we're thinking about attendance and behavior, uh, creating policies that are built on trust and communication, not punishment. If somebody says they can't be in your class, uh, believing them, <laughs> not, not uh, marking them off a bunch of points. Uh, or dropping them a letter score because they can't be in class. Sometimes it's more important to be in class than others, but we need to make sure that uh, if somebody has chronic illnesses, if they have issues with mobility, that they aren't being um, discouraged from taking the class, from continuing their education, and they're able to be successful. And it, we aren't creating policies that um, create that tension there. Um, some students might be. Uh, have the need to eat or drink uh, or in your class or know where that's going to happen. If they can't drink in your lab, know that they can leave a water bottle out in the hallway um, or that there's some place where they can securely store their stuff so that they can drink or eat or do whatever they need to. Some students might need to move their bodies or leave to use the restroom or to do other things. Um, and so being aware of that and allowing people to, to move their bodies or to leave when they need to, uh, whether or not they have documented disabilities is a great thing. Um, moving your body in class might be distracting to others, but maybe there's, if they sit in the back row, if they need to get up from their seat, um, we can make that happen. So thinking about ways that you can uh, communicate to students that they can do what they need to do um, and just build that in from day one and allow that to happen. If you have a long seminar, making sure that you're breaking stuff up into uh, chunks where you're going to actually have a break where students can go do the things that they need to look after their bodies. Technology is something that is uh, really, uh, th there's a lot of debate going on about whether students should be using technology in the classroom, right? Whether they should be taking notes by hand, whether they should be able to use their phones, et cetera. Um, and so obviously you are going to need to do what works best for your class, but think about using flexible technology policies that are focused on how it's used, uh, not when. Um, if you're gonna have an in-class discussion, maybe maybe we're not using computers during this, this time right now. Um, maybe, okay, you can pull out your computers because I want you to look up this thing right now, or I want you to be able to access this document, um, and really making sure that uh, that students know how the technology is supposed to be used. And so then if somebody has um, accommodations to use technology, it's also not outing that person or making it seem like they're getting specialized treatment. Communication um, is another big thing for uh, accessibility. So obviously uh, some students are going to have accommodations where they're going to be using interpreters or someone from CART um, who are their real-time translators. Uh, so somebody who's working remotely listening in on class through a microphone and then um, typing up captions for students that will show up on the bottom of their computer screen. It's amazing. They do such great work. Um, but 
if you are asking students to go to uh, events outside of the classroom, if you're going to uh, go to the museum, if you're going to do uh, small group work or class presentations, if you're going to be attending events, you also need to think about how you can build in um, CART services or having an interpreter into those events as well. You can request those services through the DRC, so you can actually have somebody uh, help you figure out how that um, how that's going to work. But uh, we have to keep in mind that students deserve to have everything accessible to them. Um, so how are you going to make it work for students that um, are supposed to go to this play but there isn't anybody that's going to show up and um, sign for them automatically. Um, and again, the DRC is amazing about working with you. You can request uh, services. You can talk to people from CART and figure out what they can do in order to make that accessible for your student. Um, and then when you are creating videos either for uh, your own distribution or you're using videos through like YouTube or whatever, making sure that there's transcripts um, or audio files and that you can use closed captions on those videos. If you can um, edit the, the closed captions yourself, that's amazing, but even using like the automatic AI um, is better than nothing, although they're not always great. Assignments and materials, I think this is something that we think about the most when um, we think about accommodations. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who thinks about it. Um, but assignments and materials, uh, again, ethics and compliance says everything that needs to be accessible. So we need to make sure that we're using accessible mediums for files, that the that the format is appropriate for e-readers, but also that we're getting stuff to the DRC in order for it to, uh, for them to make braille documents. Um, some students might need early access uh, to course materials or from some classes, PowerPoints and lecture notes aren't shared at all. So it might just mean access to those materials. And I understand why people are um, protective over their materials, but I also think that everyone having access to, to these materials uh, just makes a more equitable environment um, in general. Um, and especially if students have to miss class because of uh, chronic illness, if they can't pay attention um, as well because they have issues going on with their uh, with their blood sugar or whatever, having access to all of those materials is is super, super helpful. Um, in my experience, nine out of ten students is never they're never going to look back at the ma materials that I upload. Um, but for that one out of ten, it's super, super useful to have that stuff there. Um, and exists in a space where they can go back and relook at it if they missed something because of um, an audio issue, they, they still have access to the information. Building flexibility into course deadlines is also a huge deal. Um, now that we have Blackboard Ultra, um, I'm not sure if everybody's made this switch or not, but you're going to have to soon. Um, they actually have an option for accommodations and exceptions when you set up an assignment. So you can create accommodations where specific students already get time and a half um, or exceptions where specific students get extensions. However, if you're able to say this is the, the soft deadline for this, um, but you can have three day extension if you need extra time and provide that to everybody. That's awesome. Um, I know that not every class is structured in a way that allows a lot of leniency between assignments. 
um, between types of assessment because you're uh, you're moving on to the next section. But if you can have a little bit of flexibility with deadlines, or if you can even just make things where students can turn things in earlier, um, students will love that. They'll do it, uh, and it just makes it easier for for other students. Um, that do need the accommodations to be able to stay on track if you're counting in that extension time for everybody. Um, offering a variety of grading feedback is is really clutch too. Um, not just writing um, in a rubric or leaving little uh, comments um, on a document, but actually creating audio or video um feedback is super helpful especially again if you have somebody uh who can't see the document um, maybe an, it works okay with an e-reader but if you're able to actually uh talk through uh your thoughts and explain things a little bit better that's awesome if you're able to create a video where you are interacting with the document that you're uh grading that's super helpful too it's really helpful for uh, students who have ADHD as well in order to uh, focus on what's happening and not just sort of like tune out when they're reading uh, written comments. Um, and uh, keep in mind that students are also reading a ton of feedback uh, for a bunch of courses. And so if you can um, help it sync in with with an audio component or with a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, that's really, really helpful. Um, and then also providing alt text descriptions for any images. Uh, if you went through my PowerPoint, everything has an alt text description. Um, it's, it's really quick uh, to just, you know, uh, right click on the image, describe what it is uh, briefly and have it there so that students that are using like some sort of e-reader uh, using uh, looking at your your documents in um, a different format have an understanding of what the images is, is that is being used there obviously if you're using um, if you're using tables and you're using um, charts, that's super, super important that you are actually describing what's going on and that um, students that uh, do have impairments for sight are blind, um, are able to understand what's what's going on in that picture and why it's uh, why it's included. In Microsoft, uh, the 365, there's all of these features that are built in for accessibility uh, that help us, but also help students. So um, some students don't know about this and I'm happy, happy, happy to share with them, um, but there is an immersive reader option now and I think it's called read aloud in the old version of word there's also one on um, Google Docs where the document will be automatically read aloud to you so it's super helpful for students when they're um, looking at assignment sheets and whatnot if they if it helps them to hear what's going on instead of trying to read uh, the text themselves um, but it can also help them when they're when they're drafting, when they're thinking through the things that they've already written. Um, and uh, it helps you to make sure that your documents are accessible to people that are using um, e-readers as well. Um, and then there's these new check accessibility and accessibility uh, buttons on um, on Microsoft. It's there for PowerPoint and for Word. Um, and essentially it gives you it gives you feedback on whether something is accessible or not. Do you need to reformat this? Um, and then they'll help you do that. There are also these uh, built-in accessibility options into Blackboard. So if you use Blackboard Ally, that is all uh, based off of 
whether or not the your materials are accessible. Um, when you go into documents that you've already uploaded on Blackboard, uh, you or students can download the documents in alternative formats. So you can make it or you can download something in a way that is um, going to work better for for you, for other students. Um, so electronic Braille is an option. Um, and uh, and an audio file is another option. Um, I said earlier that you can set up accommodations and exceptions for students uh, built into the gradebook so that they automatically get extra time on, on assignments and that is all um, set up automatically. Um, there's also an accessibility uh, report in general that you can download um, for Adobe Acrobat also has an accessibility uh, checker. I'm I'm saying accessibility a lot. I guess it I guess it comes with the territory. Um, my mouth doesn't want to say it anymore though. Um, and then I also want to point out that on the CIDL web page we also have accessible templates. Uh, so we have the syllabus uh, template, but you can also then use that and and uh, use the formatting and create your own assignment sheet or something from that. Um, and we have information about uh, creating accessible documents in general and how to uh, create accessible tables as well. So, I'm curious, um, as I said early on, I know that a lot of you are already doing some great things um, in your classes. You're doing amazing things to help students in, in general. You're building things into your courses. Um, and I'm curious, what are some things that you are, are doing? Um, again, I'm coming from this um, with more like writing intensive courses under my belt. Um, but if you are delivering timed exams, if you are um, creating different types of assignments, I'm curious how, how you've made that uh, accessible. So what are some ways that you're making your materials more accessible or your classroom more accessible? Um, and I want to know, are, are there some challenges that you're, that you're, that you've encountered or are encountering when you are trying to make things accessible? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, it's Amanda. I, I guess um, I'm still new to this in terms of thinking more broadly about how to make the, the course in general more accessible. So. One thing that I've been focusing on this summer, um, in the spring, I did the um, Fix Your Content Day. And so I've been really working on, in Blackboard Ultra, making sure that when I'm putting things together in Ultra, that I'm checking that accessibility tool. Um, so, I mean, that's been something that's been very helpful, I thought, because I just, there's a lot of things that I would so I would might I might put an image I might take a picture of something that I um, created that we wrote on the board and upload it for people to view afterwards um, once I erase it but then didn't realize I need to have like an alt text or something explaining what that board is or what they're what the picture is of and so I've learned a lot from doing that um, I have a couple of questions of things that I think would be useful that I'm not sure how to do, um, but I'm happy to wait if somebody else wants to share first. If you just want to talk about what we're already doing first. I'm I'm fine with questions. We got time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one question is, um, you know, I have I sometimes so I use a course pack of case case studies from Harvard Business Publishing. And um, one of them that I use has an audio component, and so the students really like it because they, you know, some 
it's harder for them to read lots of material and so they can listen, but they don't all have that. And I wondered if there is some sort of service that would take sort of ex existing published materials. It's not my materials that I'm creating, um, but they could, they could get it read to them, even though it's um, from a publisher. I just, I wasn't sure if that's available that I could recommend where they could have that done. That's a good question. Um, I'm going to get back with you on that because okay. everything that I know would be a service that you would have to pay for. Um, yeah. And there's got to be something free. Um, my only thing is if it's from a publisher, um, I'm not sure about the copyright. I know. I know. Um, yeah. But that's a great question. I know I I also like listening to audio files over reading a lot. Don't tell the English department I said that. Um, well, I actually am the opposite. And so when you were describing about giving um, like audio feedback instead of written feedback, I was thinking if I did that for everyone in my class, I was thinking, I mean, there probably are students who would prefer to have it in writing because they can comprehend it better or they can go back to it and sort of it, it's it's easier for them to, for me, it's easier to read things in words than to listen to them. And 100%, I think that something that might be useful is just giving students the option. Mm -hmm. um, for, for those of us that are teaching classes that, you know, four classes with 200 students each, that's probably not realistic. Um, yeah. But if we are teaching smaller classes saying, okay, let me know if you prefer it this way or that way. Um, and just seeing what they choose. I mm -hmm. I would believe that probably 50% of the students wouldn't care one way or another, but if it, yeah. if it is going to help a few students, um, I think it's probably uh, worthwhile, yeah. Did you have another question um, too? Yeah, my last question was, I. I did not know that in Word and PowerPoint, they, they have that immersive reader button and I can't figure out how to make my Word show that. Do you have instructions for how to get that? Uh, yes, I will send that out. Perfect, um, thank you. Whether you're using it on um, the desktop or on 365 online, um, it, it shows up a little bit differently, but okay. yes. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, of course. Um, let me see. One of my friends for her lab class, she records her lecture and posts it on Blackboard with captions. Um, I'm thinking of doing that too in my lab day or in my lab class for quizzes. I give the quiz ahead of class time to the students requesting accommodations and for assignments with deadlines, I give an extra week, uh, but I make it available to everybody. I love that. I love both of those things. Um, yeah, if you are able to record um, your, your class, um, obviously it's easier if it's virtual, right? Uh, you just hit a button and set it and forget it. But um, for those of us that are teaching in person, if you're able to wear um, one of the roaming labs is what they call it, the little mic that um, uh, clicks onto you and you're able to uh, record and talk and make that happen and upload it, that's amazing. If you can just upload the notes <laughs> that you did for the day or the PowerPoint, sometimes that's um, that's enough too. That's something. Something is always better than than nothing. Um, but giving uh, quiz questions ahead of time, giving people extra time, um, that's those are all some options. And maybe it's something where they just need to say, "Hey, I need extra time." Um, maybe it's not automatically built in, but it's something that if they touch base with you, um, they get that extra time. And it's, I think, a win-win because it also reinforces this idea of uh, communication being important and that uh, you are a reasonable person that wants them to succeed, right? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, this is Nahal. Um, so one of the, um, I am, I'm, I'm teaching a very large class. We have 200 disability in society, which uh, the minimum uh, enrollment that we are having is some, somewhere around 100, 120. And last year, um, I had about 165 students in that class, and one of them was a um, student with visual impairment. And then, um, so um, I was lucky to have a TA who uh, was just uh, sitting next to this uh, individual and, um, you know, just describe the PowerPoint the slide. Uh, but one thing that we found really challenging was when it comes to um, figures or tables in the PowerPoint slides, especially as it was related to uh, when they were uh, course related, you know, when, when you use a decoration picture, that, that's easy relatively. Sure. But that was really <clears throat> difficult for, for us and challenging to explain what it is showing on the PowerPoint slide. So, that we, we tried our best and we were um, we were able to make it a very good experience for this individual. But I kept thinking about her, uh, how challenging things could be for her through uh, her academic journey. So I am I am currently uh, uh, at the uh, presidential committee for this for student with disability, and uh, one of the benefits that we are having in in those committee is that we also have students with disability as committee members so it's really interesting that they can they can share their experiences and we can hear things and how how we can accommodate the students from students with disabilities point of view right and um just wanted to share with this group that uh, despite all the laws and legislation that are supporting the rights of people with disabilities and students with disabilities is still um, many students with disabilities are reporting challenging challenges accessing the documentation. So I really liked it that when you said um, uh, right now, for example, in this committee, we are working how to, to make faculty or how to make it a requirement for faculty to use template when it comes to making syllabi uh, accessible. And um, I could see from this chat box, somebody said, um, address Blackboard. For this student, for example, accessing Blackboard was a huge challenge. So um, yeah, th those were some of the things that um, I just wanted to share with you guys. And if, if you guys have the same experience, I would be happy to hear. Thanks for sharing that. That's super, super useful. And like I said, you know, I'm coming from this writing intensive background, but thinking about tables and thinking about how can we make that stuff accessible to students that need that information. Um, I'm so glad to hear that you were able, especially having a TA is so helpful in that situation and that you're able to really work with the students and um, do what you can. Um, I know that there um, that there's definitely information online about how to make XYZ things accessible, but I know that it's not going to work for everybody 100% of the time, right? Um, there are going to be students that don't have access to technology that's going to make things easier, and those things are not provided. Um, so we also have to keep that in mind that not everybody, you know, you don't you don't come with a with a package that has all of the best tools and technology just because you have a letter of recommend or of, of accommodation from the DRC. And yeah, documentation can be very, very difficult to uh, to get and not everybody is following um, accommodations. There's there's not a lot of follow up about that, even though you know, students have the right to these things. So if we are building them into our course, if we are building um, building bridges and, and letting more students access course content and be successful, um, while other courses and other uh, faculty members might not be so welcoming, 
you know, we're here to, to serve students and sometimes it's exhausting, but I do think that if we're coming in with the mentality of this is the template that we have to use for all assignment sheets, this is the thing that I have to learn how to do alt text. And once you learn it and once you do it over and over again, it becomes second nature. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate you you uh, sharing all of that because it is a struggle. It's not something that's going to uh, quickly change overnight, but if you can make one thing more accessible right now um, and get into that mentality and think about what we can do next semester, what, what can we do when I have more time over the summer to retool these materials before the fall or over uh, winter break before spring semester, um, those are all great options. Lynn shared um, the link to our one button video studio in um, the CIDL offices. There's also a one button video studio in the library where you can come in and make your own videos um, and um, even interact with uh, PowerPoints and documents and stuff. So if anybody is interested in doing anything like that, 100%, click on that link, check it out, and you can ask um, us for more information um, or schedule some time to come in and, and check out the studio and record things. I'd love to hear from some more people if, if we have different insights or uh, even questions. This is Lynn. Um, I'd like to share my experience with students with disability in um, a large enrollment class, introductory level chemistry. So um, I had a student where I have good intention to try to get to know my students. So I walk up and down the big lecture hall, Faraday 143 and um, to checking on students and asking them questions, especially the one who sit in the back. So they know that I will be back there <laughs> when I do lecture, they are not forgotten. And then I have this one student who like, he just ignore me entirely. Like he looked at me, he know I was speaking to him. I know I was asking, him, he knows I was asking him a question and I, I was polite, calm, and he did ignore me. And I just thought that was so odd. And and after I repeat my question, he still ignored me. I decided that I'm just going to move on, walk back to the front of the room, give my lecture. And I later find out because his dad also is a colleague of mine. So I find out that he has a learning disability. And throughout his 18 years of life, he was traumatized by teachers. So he mm -hmm. was just afraid of teachers. Um, because when he interact with me via email, he was very polite, he was um, responsive, and so it was just really odd to have the two different kind of um, interaction. Um, so he, um, uh, his dad disclosed the disability um, with him too, because his dad's are my colleague. So um, they disclosed to me that he had dyslexia and it's, mm -hmm. it's inspired me to, for my exam question and for my assignment, I try to incorporate a lot of images and pictures. So instead of just like using word or um, chemistry elemental symbol as letters, right? So I try to use model like ball and stick model, how bond broken, new bond forming and things like that, because I I had him in mind. And also the probably a good percentage of student who more visual thinker than, than read and write. I myself is a uh, read and write like, if you give me feedback in an audio, it's not gonna stick with me. <laughs> it's have to be in writing. But um, so in chemistry, I try to incorporate more images and picture, but then I bump into another situation where in chemistry it's standard to use, like if it's red, it's oxygen. If it's blue, it's nitrogen. If it's um, black, it's, it's uh, hydrogen and things like that. So we have standard color, kind of distinguish the different atom. And then the student is colorblind. And I would just ask, I just, I don't know what to do. 
And I encounter student like that because I teach a lot of students per semester. So I've seen all sorts, it's like society in a nutshell that I interact with. So I, I don't know what to do. Like, do you have any <laughs> recommendation, advice? Um, how can I help individual like, like those students? Yeah, um, <laughs> thanks for sharing that, Lynn. It's, I, I, that's a great example about how uh, you can make one thing accessible for one group of students, but it doesn't mean it's, it's accessible for everyone, right? You have these people that are more visual, that's great, but then you end up with somebody who is colorblind, and then that the way that it was visual for those one students doesn't work for that student. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just that a problem like that. I mean, I would have to actually like sit down. You should you should share your materials with me sometime. Um, but uh, if you can do other things to indicate that colors are different, um, if you can use a instead of a straight line, if you can have like a dotted line, if you can um, use a description in the shape that says blue instead of just coloring it blue. Um, yes, exactly. Different patterns um, are, are helpful too. So depending on how, um, how these images are showing up, there might be a different way to uh, to allow the student to understand what's going on. I mean, if it's something where it's a document, you might even have uh, something where you could hover over a section and it could have a description, um, like the alt text, so that students that aren't able to see the variation in color can have an idea of what's going on there too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, it's uh, it's difficult. I appreciate you bringing up dyslexia too, because that's another um, that's another thing that I I've encountered so many students that will not get accommodations uh, yeah. that are ex dyslexic, and they're like, "Why does it matter now? I've I've dealt with it my entire life." Yeah. Um, and I totally understand being very f fed up with uh, healthcare systems with uh, systems for uh, disabilities, I, uh, the documentation, the runaround is exhausting. And so I have a lot of empathy for uh, people in those situations. But yeah, if you can make something more visual, if you can include audio, if you can create a different um, way to interact or to um, access the same information, it works for a variety of people. and for neurodivergent people too. So mm -hmm. you might not be able to get accommodations because um, because of the classification of disability, but it might work better for your brain to, to see materials in a different way, to interact with them in a different way. Yeah. yeah. So what I did was I turned the images in grayscale to, to make sure that the, the different shade of color show for different elements. Yeah. But it, it was just something that if the student didn't bring it to my attention, I completely blindsided. I didn't think about it. So, um, yeah. and then it's a big conversation because I have to push the scientific, like <laughs> chemical society to rethink their color scheme, right? Because they designed it without the student in mind. But um, one thing I learned is I teach large classes. So when I make my assignment and course material, um, available early for everyone and make the deadline very flexible, um, I find it's a whole lot easier. I didn't have to, all of the accommodation letter that come from DRC, I usually receive at least a dozen every semester and I already meet most of it. I only have to add the, the extra time for the time exam, but all, all the homework, the student, I didn't have to make any adjustment. Um, I already accommodate everyone. That was convenient. That's that's amazing. And that's the thing. If you are 
creating your course, if you're working on materials, I, I do this, maybe not everybody does this, but I use my breaks to work on my materials. So then when I'm starting, you know, the semester off, I'm not slammed. And if you're building that in when you're creating these materials, when you're creating deadlines, when you're thinking about schedules, um, then you aren't slammed with all of this, okay, this needs to be changed to this. Like, there are some ways that you're not going to be able to uh, maybe create all of the materials that uh, are possible, right? Um, but if you at least consider like, okay, if I have a student who is blind, how am I going to make them do this thing? If I have a student who is deaf, how am I going to make them listen to these, uh, to these songs that I want for this um, part of my course. So what can you do in order to create um, assignments and create materials that are going to focus again on the same content, on the same skills, um, but still allow students to be involved and to take them into account. Thanks so much. Yeah, I um, want to be so respectful of your time. Um, and I just have a couple final thoughts as we are, if you need to um, peace out, I understand. Um, but as we're thinking about disability and as we're thinking about um, talking about disability in our, in our classes and what sort of attitudes we wanna have, um, I recommend not using examples of disabled people to inspire people to overcome adversity. Um, it, lot, it leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Um, trusting and respecting your students, especially when they're advocating for themselves, if they don't have the documentation, um, but they're saying they need something, listen to them, try to help them as much as possible. Um, again, if you create an environment where everybody is going to be able to access materials and have policies that work for them, um, it's, it's going to create a better environment um, and they're going to be more likely to ask you for things when they need them. Um, creating policies and grading that are based on kindness, understanding a community, instead of policing punishment and compliance are gonna be benefit everybody. Being able to use the restroom when you need it is such a basic right. Um, and so many people aren't able to do that in so many classes. Um, and also don't assume that the standards that you're enforcing in your class are going to help students in the real world with their bosses. We don't know what workplaces are gonna look like three years from now. We, we probably didn't anticipate that I would be giving this uh, from home with a barking dog today. Um, I didn't see that for my life three years ago. So uh, don't assume that you know what their environment is going to be, what uh, their employers are going to allow uh, and don't make policies based off the idea that they need to learn to uh, conform to the idea that you know what's best for for them and how people should behave. Um, okay, it looks like there's just a few of us. If uh, I will be sending out again this uh, the PowerPoint, the the recording, I'll have all of my resources uh, to send out also. Are there any other questions that I can help answer right now? Thank you, that's very kind. I'm so happy that you're here and uh, participating. I'm so happy that everybody's here. I will be hanging around um, for another few minutes, but as I said, I have these resources that I'll be sending out. Um, NIU resources, as well as resources from um, elsewhere, including the CDC. Um, and if you need anything, please do reach out. Uh, here is my email. It'll be sent out also in the email that I follow up this uh, presentation with. Um, but I appreciate you all so much for um, showing up and I hope you have wonderful weekends. <laughs>